Good evening. My name is Gary Prevo. I'm the uh, director of the Global Awareness Lecture Series, which is co-sponsoring tonight with the Latino Latin American Studies program for the second event of our fall series uh, focused on Latinos in U.S. politics. The chair of LLAS, uh, Bruce Campbell, uh, asked me to um, stand in for him uh, tonight. Uh, uh, Bruce, um, his family is celebrating Yom Kippur, so he is not with us, but he has asked me to stand in for him tonight. And I want to mention that there's a third program in the series that will come up uh, two weeks from tonight. Uh, on November 1st, we will be hearing a student panel on Latinos in the U.S. elections. That's a Brother Willie's Pub at 530 program on Tuesday, November 1st. So please put that one also on your, on your calendars. Tonight, the focus really is very specifically on this election and the role of issues related to Latinos in the United States and immigrants in the United States that have emerged in a, many ways uh, from the candidacy of Donald Trump, who put um, a national spotlight from his perspective on the question of undocumented immigrants in the United States and has therefore made the rest of the political world in the United States respond uh, and think about those issues in this, uh, in this election. And tonight we have with us uh, Andrew Pantoja, who is the uh, senior analyst for Latino decisions and professor of political studies and political science and, and Chicano studies at uh, Pitzer University. He received his PhD in political science from Claremont Graduate School, and his academic research has been published in over three dozen journals and edited volumes. As a consultant, he has carried out research for organizations as varied as the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the National Hispanic Leadership Institute, and others. Um, he often uh, provides expert uh, political commentary for various newspapers, news magazines, uh, television, and radio programs. So we are very honored and privileged to have him here tonight to share uh, his thought in a topic that he, in a, to in a talk that he has entitled "Latino Politics in the Era of Bad Feelings." He'll be talking for about 45 minutes and then taking Q and A after that. Thank you. you. Please give him a St. John, St. Ben's welcome. Oh. I'll take the applause now. You haven't heard the talk, so if the talk goes poorly, then you know, at least I, I got away with the applause. A um, couple of things. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, having me, uh, inviting me to uh, deliver this lecture today. Uh, I believe this is my first time in Minnesota. I say I believe because I think um, about 10 years ago when I was driving to Chicago, I may have passed the Twin Cities. I, I don't recall, but it, you know, I was just driving rather fast and, and trying not to, to get a ticket and trying to make my way to Chicago. But, uh, so, but, but, uh, I, I, so I think this is my first time here in, in, in Minnesota and, and certainly my first time at, at uh, this, this beautiful campus. I did my undergraduate uh, degree at the University of San Francisco, which is a, a Catholic uh, Jesuit university. So. Uh, setting foot here, there were these, uh, all the Catholic motifs, so it brought me uh, flashbacks uh, to my undergraduate years, and the, uh, what, what do you call the, the faculty housing, or where, where am I staying? Guest house. Oh, the guest house, and, and the Spartan living quarters there certainly brought me back to my, my dorm life uh, as, at, at USF, so, so a lot of nostalgia going on here. Um, I have the date, October 12th, because I was under the impression that I was giving, for some reason I thought I was giving the lecture tomorrow, so I thought after dinner I'm going to get to go back to my, my dorm room, uh, prep for my talk, and then uh, 
knock it out of the park tomorrow. Well, uh, half an hour uh, before 7 o'clock, I was informed. Oh, by the way, you're giving the lecture tonight at 7 o'clock. All right. All right, so if the lecture is a bit disjointed, I apologize, although this issue of Latino politics is something I've been looking at for many, many years since the mid-1990s. Um, it's, it's, um, it's great that this is co-sponsored uh, by the program here in Latin American Studies. Um, and uh, as an undergraduate, I was really fascinated by Latin American Studies. I wanted to specialize in the politics south of the border. Uh, I could care less about what was going on north of the border. Things down south seem to be much more interesting than things up, up here. Uh, but over time, I became a specialist in the Hispanic population. Part of the reason has to do just simply with demographics. Um, how many of you have, have studied Latin America or know something about Latin America? Okay. Um, in terms of population, what is the largest Latin American country? Okay, Brazil. What's the second largest? Yes. Now this gets a little bit harder. What's the third largest? Closer. The United States. The United States. If you look at the Hispanic population in terms of its total population, about 60 million plus, if you're counting them, then by those numbers alone, the third largest Latin American country is the United States with its population. So why go south to study Latin America when I can just stay here <laughs> and know quite a bit about Latin America and, and, and the Hispanic population? So, so that, that's part of the reason why I journeyed uh, north of the border. But in this talk, I will walk you through the evolution of Latino politics, uh, how I came to study Latino politics. This is a personal journey for me. Uh, it's one that I'm well acquainted with. It's also one that uh, I'm heavily involved uh, with. So, so I'm not a mere spectator. I'm not merely reading about this uh, in an ivory tower. I'm not merely writing about this. I'm actually doing Latino politics. I'm helping to shape and increase Latino political power. I work for candidates. I work for political parties. I do all kinds of, of polling and, and advising when it comes to increasing the political power of the Hispanic population. So I have a really nice uh, inside information as to what's going on with, with this population. All right, since the 2012 presidential election, Latinos are recognized as an important political force. So 2012, uh, when those results were coming in on CNN, uh, MSNBC, and other news sources, uh, the headline there was the importance of the Latino vote. You guys don't get earthquakes, right? Okay. I'm from California, so I'm used to this. I'm like, oh, it's a little rum rumbling there. Something else, okay. Um, all right, anyways. Um, I was hoping to bring the, the good weather, not, not the earthquakes, but okay. So, um, so 2012, you know, I'm, I'm watching the news, and, and, and it's astounding for me because uh, for the first time in American history, there's this acknowledgement that this population is politically meaningful. And so for me, and in this talk, I want to understand, and I want to guide you through this discussion about how did that come about? How is it that Latinos went from being politically meaningless to being a group that is politically significant? How did that evolution come about? If you want to understand the election today and future elections, you need to understand how Latino politics has evolved. Um, this is controversial. Until 2012, Latino politics did not exist in the public consciousness. So until 2012, Latino politics was not non-existent. And, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Yet, Latinos, Mexican Americans, have been here since 1848. Sure, they were here prior to that, but they weren't Latinos. They were Mexicans or Latin Americans. But once the border crossed them, then they became U.S. Latinos, Mexican Americans, and then you have Mexican American, Latino American politics. So beginning in 1848. So when you talk about Latino politics in the past, you're largely equating it with Mexican American politics. The emergence of Puerto Ricans don't really come until uh, the post-World War II era. 
uh, the emergence of Cubans don't uh, come until after the Cuban Revolution, so in, in the post-1960s. Um, and certainly uh, in the, if you look at the 1980 census, which really is documenting changes that have occurred in the 1970s, there's, there's really not much in the way of a Central American community. Post-1980s, 1990 census, now you have half a million, a million Central Americans residing in the United States in a very short time period. So how did that come about? So, so what we know today as the diversity of the Hispanic population, the diversity of the Latino population, uh, that took time, and that's fairly recent. So if you go back pre-1950s, when you talk about Latino politics, it really is a discussion of Mexican-American politics, because they've been here since 1848. I mentioned this is a personal journey for me. I'm fortunate to be shaping Latino politics as a political scientist and as a political consultant. Those two worlds often are in conflict with one another. See, when I was an undergraduate, and, and it may have been the Catholic education, it may have been the, the influence of the Jesuits, um, I was really inspired to want to change the world, to be involved in politics, to make a difference, pursue issues of social justice. Um, and so I thought, great, I'm, I, the way I do this is I'm going to be a political scientist, and, and I want to further my education. I'm going to get a PhD in political science because then I'll really be far more impactful as a PhD than if I merely had my BA. At least that was my thinking. But then when I went to graduate school, really the goals of a political scientist were not advocacy. That's not what I was trained to do. I was not trained to be an advocate. I was not trained to pursue or advocate on behalf of these normative type questions, normative issues. Now, if you do political theory, that's a separate issue. But as a political scientist, really my role, my training was designed to advance theory, period. Advance the discipline. Political consulting, political activism, that is about being normative. That is about not merely describing what the world is. This is about describing what the world is. This is about trying to make the world into something different. So those two worlds sometimes are in conflict. And I've managed to fuse those in my life, uh, both being active as a political consultant, but also as a professor, as a political scientist. Because again, when it comes to Latino politics, it's a personal journey. I don't have the luxury of being on the sidelines. Too much is happening. Too much is happening to this population. I am part of that population for me to be a detached social scientist, a detached political scientist studying and analyzing data on a computer. I can't do that. I can't do that. I do that for part of my life. But I have to be involved. I have to get off the bench. I have to be in the game. And I am in the game. OK. When did Latino politics begin? Well, certainly that depends on your definition of politics. Mexican Americans have been here since 1848. So in many ways, since 1848, American politics has certainly impacted Mexican Americans, for better or for worse. Um, yet. Political scientists, for the most part, are interested in voting. That's really when we, when we study political science, uh, political behavior, a lot, a lot of it revolves around voting behavior. Yes, there's social movements. Yes, there's revolutions. Uh, but it's not the core of American political behavior. You know? it, it really is about voting behavior, public opinion. Uh, so if we're narrowly focusing on voting behavior and public opinion, largely electoral politics, it has a beginning. And Latino politics begins in 1960. Mexican-American electoral politics begins in 1960. It's a presidential election. Somebody in that cam in the one of the candidates is about to be a first in American history, along the lines of Barack Obama, along the lines of Hillary Clinton, the first. Who am I talking about here? Yes. And who's that? Yes. Why would Mexican Americans be enamored by Kennedy? Absolutely, absolutely. So, oops. Kennedy's Catholicism was a strong appeal to Mexican Americans. Mexican Americans decided to launch an ambitious project under the name of Viva Kennedy. They, were, they formed Viva Kennedy clubs. These are ex. World War II servicemen who go on and, and obtain 
uh, higher education. Uh, some of them are medical doctors, some of them are lawyers. Uh, most of them are residing in Texas. And they want to transform the, the, the plight of Mexican Americans. And they feel they can do it by electing Kennedy. Kennedy as a Catholic will certainly be much more empathetic to the plight of Mexican Americans. That was the thinking. So they were largely in Texas and they were going to form these clubs to mobilize Mexican Americans to turn out at high numbers to make sure Kennedy wins the state of Texas. They formed these Viva Kennedy clubs. Um, these clubs were independent of the local Democratic Party and the National Democratic Party. That's going to haunt them later. Why would Mexican Americans be wary of working with the Democratic Party in Texas. Why do you think? Who was the conservative party of the South once upon a time? Yeah. Who was the party of Lincoln? The Republican Party, the Progressive Party was a Republican. The, the Democratic Party in Texas, in the South, was not this bastion of progressive local politics. And in fact, the everyday discrimination, the Democratic Party had a stronghold in Texas, but the everyday discriminations that Mexican American face were not on the part of the you know, uh, conservative Republicans. No, it's on the part of Democrats. So they want to form this this. this, this uh, movement independent of the political parties, they thought they had a direct connection with Kennedy. How did this come about? Well, it just so happened that, that the uh, Democratic National Convention that year took place in Los Angeles. So it was a convenient location for Mexican Americans to go attend the convention. Five of them attended. At that convention, they approached JFK's brother, Bobby Kennedy, and asked him, hey, we want to form these Viva Kennedy clubs. Uh, we want to help your brother win Texas. And of course, Bobby's like, sure, by all means, go, go form those things. Um, these individuals naively believed they had a personal connection with JFK. They thought JFK knew who they were. Um, this is going to haunt them later. The goals of the Viva Kennedy leaders was to demonstrate that Mexican Americans are politically important. They wanted to make sure that JFK wins Texas. And if JFK won Texas, you know, these five or a handful, a dozen individuals that are Latino leaders, they're going to want something in return. And what do they want? They want appointment, at, they want political appointments at the federal level. Now, this is the funny thing. Um, what kinds of appointments do you think they wanted, these guys? They want to go to Kennedy and say, because of our efforts, Mexican Americans made sure you won Texas, now you owe us. They're not going to just say it that way, but in a sense, they're, they're, they're asking for that. We want an appointment. We want appointments. Appointments to what? What do you think they, they, they were asking for? This, this to me is kind of ironic, but take a guess. That, that's a great guess. I, I certainly would have wanted to be a judge. Other things. Where would you want to be appointed? Point, sure. Like what? Well, you can't be appointed to a set, but, but something, something at the federal level. The department of something, right? Maybe labor, agriculture, some of those things. What these guys wanted was appointments in ambassadorial positions. They wanted to be ambassadors. That's what they're, you're, you're like puzzled. I know, I'm, I was puzzled too. That's what they wanted. And they wanted to be ambassadors to Latin American countries because they thought they knew Latin America better than these uh, Anglos. What do they know? Uh, Nixon had a rough time in Latin America. The Communist Party was about to get a stronghold in Latin America. So if Mexican Americans go down to Latin America, they understand the subtleties of the Hispanics of Latin Americans, and therefore they'll be able to adv advocate on behalf of American democracy, American interests in these, these countries. Very naive, very audacious. Um, but I empathize. I know NAFTA has a bad name right now, but in the 1990s, I was an undergraduate at the time when NAFTA was about to be passed. And I remember sitting with, with my friends, those of us that thought, oh, one of these days we're going to be these big shot Latino 
power brokers. I can't wait for NAFTA to pass because then we'll be these mediators between Mexico and the United States. It will go, the expression was, it's going to go from Sanchez to Sanchez to Smith. We were going to be the brokers that Mexico and the United States were going to use to build trade relations, and it's going to be an economic windfall for us. Again, naive. Mexico didn't need us. Mexican elites study at Harvard. They speak perfect English. <laughs> they're, 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 at, they're at the top university in the United States. They don't need, they don't need a, you know, a Latino from, 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 uh, from, uh, from, a, border, from a border town to, to represent them. Um, anyways, that's what they wanted. Obviously, they never got those things. But more importantly, they wanted a national study on Mexican-Americans. Why? Because in the 1950s and 1960s, and some might even argue today, civil rights is largely equated, was largely equated then, maybe even now, with African-Americans. And Mexican-Americans understood that they were in a similar position. They faced similar levels of discrimination as African-Americans. And yet no one knew anything about us. Nobody knew who we were. So they wanted a national study on, on, on Mexican-Americans. In, in 1954, I believe, that was the date, somewhere in the mid-1950s, um, Mexican-Americans went before the Supreme Court for the first time in American history to argue a case based on, on an all-white jury system in Texas. It was the Hernandez v. Texas case. Um, so they go to, to the Supreme Court. And the members of the Supreme Court, this is 1954, were essentially asking these Mexican-American uh, lawyers, what is a Mexican? What is a Mexican? Do Mexicans speak English? We're, we're, we're unknown. Nobody knows us. Yet in South Texas and throughout the Southwest, high levels of discrimination. So they wanted, essentially what these guys wanted was recognition. They wanted to show or they wanted to demonstrate that Mexican-Americans and Latinos mattered. That's really what they were after. The problem is demographics plays a key role in determining a group's political weight. It's important. It really matters. In the 1960s, very few Latinos, very few Mexican-Americans in the United States, not many, were invisible. We're about 3% of the population. African-Americans are about 11%. Whites are about 85%. Our, we have a geographic concentration in the Southwest that's far removed from the centers of power, far removed from Washington, D.C. I still, to this day, have students that study in California from Washington, D.C., and are surprised at the number of Mexican-Americans in California. They're just not on the staffers in, in congressional offices or, or in various bureaucracies in Washington, D.C. We're, we're, still, we're still relatively invisible. But here's where political science matters. I think some of you are, are political scientists or political science majors. Political science matters because in the absence, there was an absence, uh, there, there, was, there never was this national study that was undertaken. But there was also an absence of quantitative data on Latinos. And that absence of that systematic data furthered our invisibility. Everything that was known about Mexican Americans, about Latinos, was really based on anecdotes, stereotypes. But that changes with the rise of the Latino National Political Survey in 1989, 1990. That's a game changer. Uh, this is the results. It was published in this, this book titled Latino Voices, Mexican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban Perspectives on American Politics. That's, that's the, uh, the book that summarizes this, this data set. So in 1989, 1990, for, if you want to talk about a national study, national data on Latinos, in particular Latino voters, something that these guys wanted back in 1960, we finally get it about 20 years later. A little over 20 years later. The LNPS has a sample of 2,817 Latinos, 1,500 Mexicans, 589 Puerto Ricans, 682 Cubans. But in the 1990s, the Latino population has dramatically changed. In the 1950 census, there were 2.3 million persons of Spanish surname. So 2.3 million Hispanics in 1950. 1990, 22.3 million. Okay. So the 1990s is a period of change. It's a period of change in Latino politics. Because one thing, one, we have numbers, and two, we have political science data that can help us understand what these numbers are doing or what this population is doing. You need both. You need both to start 
having a presence felt, your presence known in American politics. Of course, there's 22.3 million Latinos. Of course, the question is, is there such a thing as a Latino? What is a Latino? What makes us Latino? In the 1990s, Latino politics does not exist. It is regionally and ethnically fragmented. You have Mexican-American politics in the Southwest, Cuban-American politics in Miami, Dade, Puerto Rican politics in New York. It's no real Latino politics, it's very regional. In addition, we want to know if this diverse population even uses the term Latino or Hispanic. Do they use, these labels are called pan-ethnic labels. Do they even see themselves as a, as a people? No. Most people pick, this is data from the LMPS, the preferred ethnic identification is the country of ancestry. This is uh, Cuban foreign born, Cuban native born, if you're born in the US, if you're born in Cuba, Puerto Rican native born, uh, island born, uh, they're not foreign born, they're US citizens by birth. Mexicans foreign born, Mexicans native born. If you look at the immigrant population, the foreign born population, and you ask them what is your preferred ethnic identity, over 80% are gonna say, I am Mexican, I am Cuban, I am Puerto Rican. The ethnic identity is with the ancestry. Nobody's going to say Hispanic or Latino. What does that mean? I'm Mexicano. Soy Puerto Ricano. Soy Cubano. But even among the native born, it's still a significant number that prefers an identity with a country of origin. There is no Latino politics even in the 1990s. We don't even see ourselves as one. And we're regionally fragmented anyways. I have no idea what Cubans are doing. I have no idea what Puerto Ricans are doing. They don't know what's going on, you know, it's 3,000 miles away. I mean, this is a big country. It takes a while to, to traverse the country. <laughs> but the 1990s, is, I, I pointed out that the 1990s is, is a significant time period because of the demographics, it's larger. We have data that's coming in. But we also have the rise of Latino think tanks, like the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute. Latino research centers at universities, Latino think tanks are critical because they help us to break down stereotypes. They help us analyze the needs of this community. How do I know what Latinos want? How do I know what they're gonna vote for? Who they're gonna vote for? How do I know their partisan preferences? How do I know their policy needs? I can't just go and ask my mother or my neighbor, hey, what do you need? Who are you gonna vote for? It's anecdote, stereotypes. But once I have systematic data, nationally representative data, I can tell you what Latinos as a whole are thinking, or I can tell you what particular subpopulations are thinking. So the 1990s, for me, is a period of optimism. Well, I didn't know that. I was, I was probably a freshman year at the time, and so I, I'm thinking of something else. I don't know. Not thinking about Latino politics at the time. But then I had to think about Latino politics. I had no choice. Again, when I talked, when I mentioned earlier that I could not afford the luxury of being on the sidelines, it's because of Proposition 187 in California in 1994. Donald Trump's rhetoric is not new to me. That campaign is not a new campaign. I witnessed that campaign. I witnessed that rhetoric. I witnessed an actual policy in California, progressive California, in 1994, in the mid-1990s. What happened in California? Well, one, not in California, globally, the Cold War came to an end. California, major supplier, major uh, geographic location of the defense industry. Well, now that the Russians are gone, now that the Soviet Union's gone, what are we gonna do with all these armaments? Why do we need to build all these weapons? Close down the plants. The country is in the midst of a recession. California's recession lingers longer. Pete Wilson, Governor Pete Wilson, is about to lose the election. Then he notes that there's this initiative 
And if he ties his campaign to Proposition 187, his numbers go up. So he does. And what was Proposition 187? Proposition 187 was called the Save Our State Initiative, SOS. California needs help. Save our state. Save our state from who? Immigrants. Immigrants. Undocumented immigrants. California is a mess because of all those illegals. Not my language, but the language that was used at the time. And Californians voted for Prop 187. And the rhetoric, the, 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 the statements that were made, the commercials that were run, uh, that criminalized, that portrayed immigrants, slash, by definition, Hispanic, I'm, I'm like third generation, you know, like, what, what, what do I have to do with immigrants? But all of a sudden, I'm, I'm persona non grata in my own state of California. Um, all of a sudden, we're public enemy number one in California. And it passes. I was an undergraduate at USF when it passed, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Nothing. Why aren't Latinos voting? Why aren't we turning out? Why, aren't, why isn't anybody writing an op-ed piece? Where are the counter-narratives that say, these guys are wrong, immigrants aren't doing all these bad things? I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years old. Part of my life, what, what the hell do I know? I'm, I'm just a kid. How, how can I stand up to these guys? I don't know, any, I don't know anything. I, I, my gut feeling tells me they're wrong, but I, I don't have any data. I don't, I don't have any way of countering this. But it was a wake-up call to me. I, I, you know, I, I wanted to study other politics. I wanted to do other things. But because of this, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, if it's not you, if it's not you that's going to get the PhD, if it's not you that's going to do the writings, that's going to do the analysis, who else? You think there's a line of hundreds of pantojas waiting to take, to step in your shoes? Regrettably, no. Regrettably, no. There wasn't then, and there's, there's, there isn't now. So in graduate school and beyond, I built my career studying the political consequences of Prop 187 and strategies, the politics, for ways of defeating these types of initiatives, these types of candidates. So 2016, you better believe I was well prepared. I'm not this scared 20 year old kid anymore. You know? I'm armed with data, I have a PhD, I have all these things. You know? I'm working for the Democratic Party. <laughs> you know, some members of our team are working for the Hillary campaign. Do you think we're gonna let this uh, individual, I have other words to say, but uh, we'll let this individual <laughs> you know, get away with this stuff? No, no way. No way. So I built my career studying the political consequences of 187, and essentially what I am able to demonstrate with data is that Latinos reacted, Latinos turned out in record numbers. California was a state that gave us Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan. It's not going to happen anymore. California is a solidly blue state now, and it's going to stay that way for a long time. Why? Demographic changes, political changes. We're not these weak kids, or we're not these uh, uh, the small population that that, uh, that that could not fight back. We could fight back with increase in voter registration. We can turn out and vote in record numbers, and we did. We did in California. The Repub there, there's no Republican. The Republican Party is non-existent in California. So that was California. Things changed in reaction to that politics, to that venomous politics. But the demographics now continue beyond California, continue nationally. Um, Hispanic is it's orange. So somewhere around uh, a little after the 2000 census, Latinos, Hispanics become uh, the largest minority group in the United States, somewhere around 2045. They keep moving it up. It was 2050, now it's 2045, maybe it'll be 2040, somewhere around here. Um, this country is going to go from one that has historically been majority white to one that looks like California. 
where the white population is a demographic minority. So this country is going to be, if you sum up the minority populations in about 2045, even if you stop immigration now, the demographic changes are just, you know, birth rates and, and the, the age factors, all these other factors, um, that's inevitable. Um, the country is going to be majority minority. That's going to have a profound impact on politics. Absolutely. The racial composition, the size, the share of minority voters relative to the white electorate is increasing. Everyone said Donald Trump's trouble. Can Donald Trump, after the primaries, can he pivot? No. He, he hasn't done <laughs> No, okay, no, I'm holding back here. Um, I'll celebrate after, the, after November. Um, the idea was, it's not can he pivot, but if he wants to win, he's gonna have to pivot. He's got no choice because of the political demographic realities on the ground. He's got no choice, he's gonna have to pivot. There's no pivoting, so you lose. Now, once upon a time, in the 1990s, when I was 20 years old, 20 years ago, there was no such thing as Latino politics. It was regionally fragmented. It was ethnically fragmented. But now, this diverse population is, is using the term, the pan-ethnic terms Hispanic and Latinos. They do see themselves as one. They're beginning to see themselves more as one. Um, even in their partisan identity, there's so many data points that I could show you that shows the skewness in this, this sense of oneness that, that is happening. Even when you ask them, are Latinos, Latinos are, we say they're, they're not a racial group, they're an ethnic group, because racially, Hispanics, Latinos could be anything, you know, racial ethnicity is just kind of meaningless concepts, but anyways, we, we still employ them in, in the social sciences. Um, we asked in the Latino National Survey, this is after the LMPS, this is in 2006, we have a new data set, new survey, we asked them, do you see themselves, do they make up a distinct racial group? Are Hispanics a race? Yeah, you know, they're beginning to see themselves as a racial group. More importantly, a sense of linked fate is growing. How much does your own well-being depend on the well-being of other Hispanics, Latinos? We asked Latinos, does your own well-being depend on the well-being of other Hispanic Latinos? That's called linked fate. Among African Americans, the sense of linked fate is very, very high. This is why you have, in African American communities, among African Americans, economic heterogeneity, but political homogeneity. Even if I'm upper class, highly educated African American, politically, I'm still voting with someone with low social, lower social demographics. Why? Because I have this sense of linked fate. I understand the fate of my people. Hispanics are beginning to develop this sense of linked fate. At this point, I'm just telling you what is. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you my own agenda later, but I'm just telling you why, what is. Why has this happened? I would argue anti-immigrant, and by extension, anti-Hispanic rhetoric, anti-Latino rhetoric, and demographic dispersion are creating this sense of commonality are creating the forging of a sense of commonality. I mean, you know, when, when, when you attack people, you know, they turn inwards. You know, they, they seek each other for assistance, for help. You know, you, you, I, I, this, is, this is, maybe we'll, we'll get to the Q&A, but I, I want to live in a post-racial America. I don't, you know, ethnicity, race, I don't, I don't, it's just meaningless. You know, they, they exist because we believe they exist. So if people believe these individuals exist and see them as a threat, they're gonna see themselves as a distinct population. So now we're moving forward, 2008, 2012. Obama wins as a pessimistic political scientist who was scarred in the 1990s. I thought, there's no way, why? the Democratic Party's foolish. How can you elect Barack Obama? How can you elect an African American to be, to be the leader of your, your, your party, to, to, to run for the presidency? There's no way this guy is gonna win. 
I know enough data. I know enough about prejudice and racism, implicit racism, uh, the Bradley effect, all these things in political science that show us there's no way this guy is going to win. But he wins. Holy smokes, I was wrong. I was wrong. Or was I? <laughs> Obama wins, but not among whites. 2008 should have been a landslide. The Bush, maybe you were really, I don't even want to ask how old you were in 2008. Young. Young. Um, the Bush administration was not a popular administration. I know you can't see this, 43 and 650, I don't know, 55. Um, was not a popular administration. We're in the midst of two unpopular wars. The economy's in the tank. It should predict a democratic landslide. But if no minorities voted, Obama would have lost. He does even worse in 2012. So the news story in 2012, what I'm tuning into the news, is the importance of Latino voters. Being deterministic in places like Colorado, Florida, New Mexico, Nevada, critical in Ohio, Virginia. Romney only wins about 23% of the Hispanic vote. George W. Bush did it right. I'm not anti-Republican. I mean, you know, we can vote Republican. In fact, many Latinos do vote Republican. They voted for George W. Bush. In our own surveys, about 50, somewhere in the low 50s, 54, 55% of the Hispanic population in our national surveys have voted Republican at one point or another. They can vote I particularly care. It just depends on what policies you adopt. Anyways, but this is not, this is how you lose an election. Even though you, only, you get, you, uh, Obama, even if, if, if you only win 40% of the white vote, you know, you'll still lose an election if you're, if you're a Republican. So in 2012, I'm sitting watching the news, seeing that the uh, Latinos have now the national spotlight. We've, we've, we've made it. In 1960, the Viva Kennedy Clubs, really what these guys wanted was recognition. These guys wanted recognition. And they got it. We got it in 2012. So what next? I was optimistic. I was celebrating. Certainly this is, this is going to be a new era in party politics, a new era for the Democratic Party. Certainly they're going to learn the lessons of McCain, of Romney, Dole, how not to run an election. You want to win? You want to run a good election? George W. Bush. Take a playbook out of George W. Bush. Ronald Reagan. This is not what I anticipated. I did not, I did not see this coming. I didn't want to see this coming, but it came in the list. Um, so Latino politics has grown uh, but Latino politics has many challenges. Uh, so, among, so, for example, our turnout rates are about at 50% of what they should be. In other words, there are 23 million Latinos that are over the age of 18 U.S. citizens. They're eligible to vote. They're what we call the eligible electorate. 23 million that are eligible to vote. Yet in 2012, only 12 million voted. So my entire life thus far, at least since getting my PhD or in grad school, not only studying the effects of 187, is basically designed to narrow that gap. How do we narrow that gap? How do I increase turnout into, my, into much uh, higher rates? So I started in the 1990s working for the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute. And since then, I've moved on to uh, working with Latino decisions, um, Advising candidates, advising parties, advising interest groups, uh, nonprofit groups, uh, individuals that are interested in, in empowering the Hispanic population. Um, we're there to provide some kind of a roadmap to how it's done. Um, will there be a Trump effect? I spent my career writing about the Prop 187 effect, how 187 mobilized Latinos in California to vote against the Republican Party. This is a tracking poll that we've been carrying out. This, we're in the fourth week of the tracking poll. And Trump's unfavorabilities are, are really, really high. So people are asking, will there be a Trump effect? Will Donald Trump mobilize? Will his campaign 
just like 187, mobilize Latinos to political action. Here's where, again, I wear, now I put on my political science hat to answer that question. Voter turnout, the variables can be grouped into three broad categories, social demographic resources, psychology, and mobilization. The Prop 187 story that I wrote so much about is a psychology story. It's about what people do when they are threatened. What do people do when you are facing a political threat? You fight fire with fire. It's a political story. I overplayed, and, I'm, and I'll admit it here, I overplayed the psychology. I overplayed the affect. I overplayed the role of fear. In California, there's also a mobilization story. I just didn't have the variables at the time to capture those things. I, just, you know, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't looking for that at the time. But anecdotally, there's enough that has emerged to say, look, unions in California mattered. Uh, groups like Chirla, immigrant rights groups, uh, Central American groups that were active in the 1980s became much more politicized and po not much more political, turned their attention now, now north, politics north of the border. Those groups were mobilizing, registering, conducting citizenship drives. There's a mobilization story to this. So if Latinos are going to turn out in record numbers, um, Trump, the hatred and fear of Trump alone is not going to do it. They're going to have to receive some kind of a go TV message. And nationally right now, about 42% of Latinos say they've been contacted. If somebody contacts you, if somebody votes, you turn out and vote. Now, it increases the probability of you voting. Um, we need higher contact rates. And who's doing the contacting? This is in week four. 63% say it's coming from the Democratic Party. 19% say it's coming from the Republican Party. Earlier, uh, uh, where, where, you, you had mentioned uh, Matt, right? You had mentioned uh, Trump doesn't have a, 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 ground, a ground campaign. Oh, yeah, we're picking that up. It's nobody on the ground reaching out to Latino voters saying, hey, by the way, have you considered voting for Trump? Or, or even if you're not voting for Trump, guess what? There's Republican candidates in, in Congress and the Senate. You know, they're not being contacted. It's the, it's the Democratic Party that's doing the contacting. If this were a close election, I would have spent more time uh, looking at some of these states. I know this is not a battleground state, but I, you know, there's so many Latinos. It's like, come on, come on, <laughs> come on turn Texas blue. It's my, it's my, I was born in Texas, so I, I have a special place in my heart for wanting to see it go blue someday. Um, but, uh, but no, I, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a, a, it looks like it's going to be a landslide. So the story continues. In 1960, World War II Mexican-Americans, Mexican-American servicemen had an audacious plan, very audacious plan. This is one of them, um, uh, Hector P. Garcia. Uh, they formed Viva Kennedy Clubs to gain political recognition. Today, the work of the Viva Kennedy generation continues. And I'm proud to be part of that group of individuals that has taken the baton and will soon well, maybe not too soon, start looking toward the future to pass that baton to others. So I'll stop here. Thank you. What happened at 45 minutes from when he was, the introductions were completed, so the floor is now yours. So. Not bad for not prepping, all right? <laughs> okay, I'll give myself. Yeah, so uh, comments or questions? I mean, anything, even if it's, tangentially related, if, it, if something you've heard about Hispanics or Latinos and, and want some clarification, uh, let me know. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for coming out, um, coming to St. John's. When do you think we'll see a Latino in the White House? Well, uh, we were going to ask some, some poll questions. Um, oh, this has been recorded, right? Okay. Um, This is me, the political scientist, not the consultant. We were hoping to see a vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket with Hillary Clinton, and some names were being, uh, were being considered. So we were, uh, I, by we, me, and people that I know, I guess, uh, were, were, uh, were looking forward to that. So we thought sometime soon, uh, 
that's something that, that uh, we thought it would happen much sooner, but it seems like it's something that will be postponed toward uh, future elections. We thought, you know, we at least thought there would be a VP candidate on the ticket. Uh, uh, sorry, a VP Latino, a Latino on the VP ticket, anyway, yeah. Uh, this election, but, but it, that, that ended up not being the case. Um, having said that, yeah? Um, inside, I mean, any sense of how close that might have happened? Any, any sense of whether any of the candidates from the Latino community that were being bandied about, whether they got serious consideration? No, 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 there were three that got serious consideration. Absolutely, no, no, no. There were, there were some serious uh, vetting going on, and at the time, uh, when Trump's numbers seem to be rising and, and looking strong, I think the campaign, and again, this is, I don't have, ins I'm not working for the Hillary campaign, I'm not, I don't have any inside information there. My own readings of the newspapers, like every, everybody else, my, my readings were that there was a panic moment that, you know, how far can he take this? Will those numbers keep going up? We need, we need to uh, uh, make sure we don't, we can't, like Republicans, we can't really rely, Republicans cannot only rely on white voters, the Democratic Party cannot only rely on minority voters. So you need to find, you need to appeal to white voters. They still, they still represent over 70% of the electorate. So they're still, it's a still, even though demographically they're in the 60 percentile, in terms of voter representation, they're overrepresenting the electorate. So you need to win with white voters. The California story too, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give you the impression of an us versus them story, although it was, it was, it was presented that, not by me, but, but by the, 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 those that propose these ideas. Um, the California story is one of also, the reason California turned blue was because whites also rejected that rhetoric. Significant number of whites in the state were also, uh, did not want to be associated with that kind of uh, rhetoric, those kinds of policies. And so it's not only a Latino story that turned California blue. They're an important part, but white voters in the state, Democratic voters in the state, were, were pivotal. Anyway, so I, I, I could go on, but other questions? Other, other no things? joke that Kane, you remember Kane's uh, acceptance speech, how, how much Spanish he spoke in that, in that speech. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't just quick, but it was paragraphs. Yeah. That, so that was the first. Right, right. right. In some ways, the Democrats kind of have their sort of their traditional white male governor, senator. But he's very fluent, yeah, he's fluent in Spanish. So yeah, yeah. Plenty of ties. And that matters. I mean, it's not only symbolism. People, I, you know, I've been asked, like, well, you know, do Latinos respond to pandering? Well, it's, it's not solely pandering, but, but I'll take pandering any day <laughs> over threat. <laughs> you know, if it's present pandering or threat, I'll, I'll take the pandering, sure. You know, um, but again, in 2012, I, I, I really thought and we talked about this over, over dinner, there was that st strategic paper that the Republican Party produced in 2012 that essentially said, moving forward, we need to expand our base. We need to reach out to Hispanics. We need to reach out to women. We need to, be, we need to transform what, how we are perceived. And I thought that was the direction the party was going. Will there be a future Latino president? Probably. Could, well, you know, I, I talked about uh, a VP, but you, know, you had, uh, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, so the answer could be yeah, and it could come from the Republican side. So, you know, it's, it's not only a Democratic story here, a lot of it, you know, what Latinos end up doing in many ways, it's in the hands of, of Republicans and it's in, it's in the hands of those individuals that wield economic political power. Now, you have a greater say in as far as where this population is going to go, you know. Republicans could win the Latino vote, absolutely. They've done it. But this election was not one that I anticipated. But again, I've, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. It's not new. Yeah. Um, the way the red rate kind of crumbled the GOP in California, do you first see the same thing happening in the nation? Yeah, so, so what happened in California now, so Latinos in the 1990s took the spotlight in the state. And it's a big state. It's a big state, California. Um, but as those demographic, as those numbers increase nationally, uh, what was once seen as a state-specific threat now turned into a national threat. 
and the Republican Party did collapse in California, and there's a lot of uh, discussion right now that the Republican Party is clearly unraveling. Uh, and um, but you know you can you can look at it as 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 it has challenges, but but at the same time. Uh, it could also be a, a period to rebuild, start anew, do something different, and, and start appealing to a to a, a, a rising a new electorate that is out there. Okay. Um, so, do you think that Donald Trump's like really mean rhetoric like, to the Spanish people kind of hurt the chance of a Democrat uh, choosing a Spanish VP, like a Hispanic VP, because they kind of already have covered something that's kind of trying to grab them over already? Yeah, I mean, certainly to to. You know, one of the, one of the you know the I want certain legislation to pass. I want comprehensive immigration reform to pass. I would like to see Latinos on the VP ticket or Latino on the VP ticket or Latino. You know, at the same time, I'm offering that advice to the Democratic Party. Not that I'm like, oh, I'm on the phone with them. Like, hey, you need to do. You know. You know, I, I'm through writings, through other channels. At the same time, they're also looking at their own data, their own polls to say, what kind of a backlash could we have if we do these kinds of things that they're recommending over here? So it's that balance. On the one hand, yes, go forward, do all these progressive politics, I mean, yeah, support Bernie Sanders, you know, all, those, all those kinds of things. At the same time, look, there's also an, a, a broader political reality that you don't want to alienate white voters as well. So. Those are, those are those balancing acts that a party has to make, uh, a can, every candidate has to make, and I'm not the party, I'm not the candidate, and so when they don't go with my decision, of course, I'm gonna say it's a foolish decision because I know better, but I, I don't, I don't. Yeah. I think part of this question gets at, what if the Republicans had nominated Jen Bush? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh. What if the Republicans had nominated Jen Yeah, oh. It, Yes, yes, yes. Oh, the, yeah, it would have been, this would have been a, you know, again, the, looking at the data, looking at these trends, he would have been the natural choice. He should have been the choice, or even Marco Rubio, but Jeb Bush in particular. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it just wasn't meant to be among, among, in, in, among uh, Republicans in the primaries, or, or that core segment that was turning out in the primaries. Again, the primaries, most people don't bother voting. Most people don't care unless you're highly partisan. And the turnout rates and, and the people that are turning out for the Republican side and, and the primaries are, are, are strongly you know, partisan, strongly identify with more conservative elements of the Republican Party, so Jeb Bush didn't have a chance. Um, but you know, this, this is my IR hat. Some of you that have studied IR, international relations. Uh, again, I didn't want anything to, I didn't want, any, I didn't want to do, I, I, I'm stumbling here. I, I, was, I was interested in politics abroad, not politics in the United States. Uh, but there's a great book in international relations by, uh, I think it's Robert Axelrod, The Evolution of Cooperation. Um, politics is not a one-time thing. As, as soon as this, in, what, what do you have, 28 days or something like that? You start planning for the next election. It's, it's ongoing, it's not a one-time thing. So individuals like Jeb Bush, I, I don't see this as the end, or Marco Rubio, or Te, you know, some of these folks will be back. So politics, you get, to, you get to, in a democracy, maybe in other systems as well, you, know, you, you get to fight another day. You know, politics for Latinos didn't end in 1994. It's continued and it will continue. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's not a, it's not a one-shot deal. Um, having said that, the lessons of evolution of cooperation is about, is about, uh, is about the, the virtues of cooperating. You know, you're better off when you cooperate with each other. Anyway, okay, others? Other, other thoughts? Yeah? So if the numbers were George W. Bush in the 40s, 49 percent, uh, and then McCain and Ron, 40%. forty percent. McCain then down into the high twenties. Yeah, low low twenties, low twenties. Uh, Ron twenty two, and we said separate Trump being below twenty. Yeah, I've been saying for a long time. There's no way. Just the things he was saying. There's no way this guy's going to break twenty percent. So the other half of the question is: 
given the, the will to change things in 2012, which obviously didn't materialize, from what I read, one of the big factors is, you know, Tea Party, neocon, things are very strikes, hijacked, whatever plans any higher level, national level, Republican, national committee people are, are wanting to plan. Yep. Yep. And I would imagine that the numbers of Latino, are, is there any data on Latino sympathizers for those kinds of, broadly within the Republican Party, but really seemingly fighting against the direction of leadership? Well, well, yeah, um, I have friends that are Latino, I, I don't, I, maybe high-level Republicans is too, too strong of a word, but, but they're active in the Republican Party, and, and they're, they're individuals like Ana, Ana Navarro, who is just pissed at, at Donald Trump, and, you know, and she's Republican, the fact that Leonel Sosa the, the guy, the architect of Ronald Reagan's uh, campaign resigned and had wanted nothing to do with the Trump campaign. So, so there are high level Latinos in the Republican Party that on the one hand believe in its more mainstream or core, the philosophy of, of the, the Republican elite and Donald Trump and the Tea Partiers have kind of hijacked that and, and just want nothing to do with that. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's public opinion data. I mean, the fact that you're, you know, Donald Trump is still getting somewhere in the teens, whereas African-Americans, we, we can't find anybody on the data like that, that, are, that is backing Donald Trump. It's at the like 0% African-American support, somewhere in the uh, low percentile. Whereas Latinos, you're still getting 11, 15%. It's like, who are these like 15% Latinos? These are not Latino elites. These are everyday Latinos that are backing Donald Trump. I mean, it's, it's Oh, I, I thought I had my laptop. It's like, I'll, I'll show you all the, the tracking polls. But, but yeah, I mean, he's not going to break 20%, uh, but he's going to be in the teens nationally with Hispanic, 15% of Latinos. So out of, out of let's say, 13-something million that cast a vote, 15% of that, you know, it's, it's not nothing. But then after an American vote for Trump will be... Well, I, I, single digits, yeah. Right now it's single digits. So, so this is something that, that some reporter friends of mine have asked me, like, like who are these Latinos? I want to talk to them. I want to know them. And, and, and anecdotally, I, I, know, I know some of these folks uh, from Texas, uh, you know, friends of mine. And this is, this is not the elite, at the elite level. These are just everyday folks that are, that are you know, Texas, it's, it, it, there, it, there's hunting, there's outdoors, uh, a lot of outdoors, and there's strong support of the, of the Second Amendment. So having said all those other things, um, you know, they're, they're second, third generation Hispanics, and so the immigration issue is, is far away, and, and for them it's a Second Amendment issue. And, and they feel that, as backers of the NRA, they feel that Hillary's going to take their guns. But they're, yeah. Well, is it also within the Latino community in the United States, aren't there some different views about the immigration question? I mean, you got it. Families have been here before Americans, yeah, yeah. or at least for generations, they don't automatically identify with the, uh, those that have come across the border right. to take work. In other words, that, that there are some divides in the Latino community that can then lead some of them even to potentially uh, embrace uh, some aspects of Trump's Essentially, what I, I agree that with this colleague of mine who's been looking at Asian American voters and, and he essentially has said, look, if the Republican Party just takes the immigration issue off the table, just pass conference, do something, get it off the table, uh, then what, what else is left? You know, there, then, then uh, the second issue in the tracking poll that's polling really high and it, and it surprised me again. One of the things I love about polling is that as much as I think I know Hispanics and I know Latinos because I happen to be one and I've been looking at this for two decades. The good thing with data is that when you ask the questions, you have no idea what you're going to get. You have some idea, uh, but for the most part, where, where the numbers fall, it's like, well, that's what they want. So, the sec so immigration, on the t we asked the open-ended question, what is the top issue facing the Hispanic community today or the top issue, no, the top issue facing the nation today or the top issue guiding you to asking, you know, leading you to the polls. So immigration is number one. Uh, the second one that I did not anticipate is terrorism for Latinos. 
Terrorism is, is, is up there. And, and in the Asian American polls, I've seen terrorism also score up there as well. There's something about this campaign and the, and the rhetoric. There's, there's, there's a lot of theories in public opinion about public opinion being informed at the, by elite, from the elite down to the mass public. There's that model. Um, Latinos are thinking about terrorism. They have to be thinking about jobs or education or something else, but terrorism is up there. Uh, and and this, this is, yeah, this is why um, so, so in, 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 I, I think there are some individuals that, that understood that that was going to be an important issue that Donald Trump could use against Hillary, so that people want to poll and see where that's going. And, and, and it, is, it is up there. It is up there for Latinos. And again, I, I, don't, I don't worry about terrorism, but Latinos do. You know, at least in the in the polls. Other questions? Yeah. Um, question I have is: Have kind of the harsh immigration policies of the Obama administration, particularly like family detention, um, more deportations, has that impacted how it has impacted any political interaction or views of the Democratic Party? No. Um, it has impacted the views of my colleagues with PhDs or that are closely following those things and that our Latinos are like, you know, and, and even some progressives, uh, this guy who worked for the Bernie Sanders campaign, he was his Latino outreach effort. I think he was the individual that coined the term the deporter in chief. Uh, so among a certain segment of Latinos, yes, they know what's going on. Um, but in the public opinion polls, Obama's favorability ratings among Latinos is, is very, very high, you know, so. Have you been able to track it from when he took off his first or something? I mean, is it even, if there's no, there's your point, it doesn't show any disappointment with Obama? Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look at, I could, get, there's so, the good thing about post 1990s is that there's so many polls now on the Hispanic population that were non-existent in the 1990s so you could actually track that over time but I haven't seen anything to suggest any kind of decline uh, but that's also true among the, the broader electorate Obama's favorabilities are pretty high so that's playing in the favor you know of, of the for the Democrats Latinos it's, it's much higher um, but yeah th those kinds of things like don't you know what's going on yeah but but again, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the pandering over the threats. <laughs> you know, what's the alternative? Right. Jeb Bush, then maybe it's a different, a different situation. You also have the dream uh, his, you know, executive action there, which somewhat offsets. I mean, it sort of splits, means he's got in the middle. It's, it's, it's easier. Yeah, and, and again, of, co I, of course I want those things to pass in the first part, the, his first administration, but. But politically, you start weighing all these things and you say, look, this is not Rahm Emanuel telling him, look, it's, it's a third rail pot. Don't, don't, don't take up immigration. This is not, you know, this is, this is, this. In every election up until this one, when the media talks to me, at least since I've been doing this, when the media asks me about the role of immigration, I basically say the position of the candidates is going to be the same. Nobody wants to touch immigration because it's, it's, it's a messy issue. You, you're gonna, I called it a political hot potato. You're going to get burned. Um, this election was diff different. Trump, Trump dove right into immigration. Um, but for the most part, if you look at Obama's campaign, if you look at McCain's or other, well, actually, it's, there's variations. Uh, but, but everybody says the same thing. I want, comp you know, vague terms. I want to pass comprehensive immigration reform. I want secure borders. I want, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, but uh, yeah, this campaign was different. Yeah. Other thoughts? Other questions? Just then, I'll ask. The, I'll ask one final okay. one. Um, what in any of the poll would indicate then of what specifically is expected of the Clinton administration by the Latino community? Not yet. Any, Not yet. Anything new there other than somehow find a way to uh, execute immigration reform? Uh, no, I mean, I, I haven't, we haven't done any polling. 
because we're still in the midst of the election about like, we, we're not thinking just yet, maybe some of us are, but you know, what comes next? Now, what are your expectations at Hillary? I, I, I have recently designed some questions because it came up in the debate on the Supreme Court, so I'm gonna ask some questions on the Supreme Court, um, questions about women, um, but, but uh, nothing beyond that in, in, in great detail. So we'll, we'll see the what next, um, you know, what, what, Latino, what, what Latino expectations are, what Latino turnout will be. Um, and, um, and again, where, where, you know, where the story, you know, where it goes. I'm, I'm curious to remain active and, and helping to shape the story. And, and if I can leave you with some final words is for you to be involved in the story as well, to, for you guys to be active in this political story. Don't be on the bench, don't be on the sidelines, just merely observing politics. Go out and do politics. You know, we need new voices, that baton needs to be passed to other individuals and the politics of the past, you know, these categories, they, 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 they could be reshaped. I, I, I came of age when, when uh, under the Reagan administration, and, and I'll, I'll admit it here, uh, when I turned 18 and, and um, was able to register to vote, I, I registered as a Republican. You know, I, I, I like Reagan. You know, this is just, I, I'm a naive high school kid. I didn't know about all the stuff going on in Central America. <laughs> you're, you're like, you're like oh, what? Did you know what he did? In I did now, but at the time I didn't. At the time, you know, I, this, this is a you know, guy that's tough to the Russians and like jelly beans and, and uh, you know, all, the, all, those, all those, those images. And, and uh, it, was, it was impressive to me. Plus, I had an uncle that was in the Secret Service, so I, he had photographs of Reagan. I was like, oh, my God, this, this is amazing, you know, up close. Um, but, he but he also passed comprehensive immigration reform. Absolutely. Yeah, at IRCA. So, um, you know, so... Um, you know, these categories aren't fixed, so, so if you are working within the Republican Party, you can shape that Republican Party in whatever direction you want, or for the Democratic Party, or for other parties, or other candidates. Um, you know, it's your, it's your, it's your future. I'm, 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 we're on our way out, you know? You guys, you guys are, are next in line, so I'll leave it there. <laughs>